So I want to talk to you a little bit about Ella Deloria and her reflections on indigenous Native American life in the Episcopal Church context as a sort of uh, coda, if you will, to this conversation about mission to Native American communities. Ella Deloria writes a book uh, that is called Speaking of Indians, which is written in the um, during World War II, as you can tell from the text, that is a reflection on how the Lakota people have transitioned to both life on the reservation, transition to um, Christianity, transitioning to adapting to a United States context. Ella Deloria is part of a wider um, family of prominent uh, Lakota Episcopalians. Her father, uh, Philip Deloria, is the first Lakota Episcopal priest. She's the aunt to Vine Deloria Jr., who writes God is Red, which is one of our early Native American liberation theology texts. And so she talks about the transition to Christianity and its effects on this way on page 102 of Speaking of Indians. The good news banished fear of the elements. It extended man's duty to his neighbor beyond tribal limits and showed him God in the face of Jesus Christ. As you read this portion of Speaking of Indians, Shirley talks about um, these three aspects with various anecdotes and illustrations. While the Lakota uh, revere the earth and creation, she reveals that some have a very anxious uh, relationship to the elements. And she tells the story of one woman in particular who's terrified of thunderstorms. And so to place the gospel in relationship to the God of creation uh, has a sort of effect on a Lakota worldview, she explains. Similarly, this notion that one ought to love one's uh, neighbor, one's ally, one's friend as what oneself seems very uh, self-evident to uh, the Lakota, as she explains in another passage, Yet the notion that one ought to love one's enemy is a transformative piece and moment for uh, conversion to the gospel uh, within her context. And one could argue that is part of the core message of Christianity and something that's transformative uh, in the relationship to other world religions. And the idea that when one encounters Jesus Christ, one encounters the God who is above all things. And that too is framed as a new insight uh, in a Lakota spirituality, where that relationship to um, the God who's above all things was more distant. And so conversion to Christianity is framed by Ella Deloria as a process of transformation of Lakota life that both allows them ideally to retain their core identity while also offering spiritual advancement. Now, we want to perhaps have questions for Ella Deloria as well about these framings, and we'd want to expand our reading of Lakota source material Indeed, putting Vine Deloria in conversation with Ella Deloria could be a very important and useful thing to do here. But she puts this up for us to consider the benefits of conversion to Christianity in a Lakota context. And she notes that conversion is accelerated by several things, primarily around literacy and education. So she talks about this, how the uh, Bible is translated into Lakota over the period of a generation between 1840, when it first begins, to its conclusion in 1879. And she reveals that while uh, Europeans, uh, both um, English and French speaking, it turns out in her narrative, are definitely invested in missionary work among the Lakota people, that it's not simply European, Euro-Americans who are driving the conversion process, but there is a desire to know the Bible and to be transformed by it within the people. And so she talks about uh, Lakota internally doing missionary work among each other as part of a conversion process also.
education features prominently in how she talks about this conversion process. And here she speaks of the boarding school system. The boarding school system has been much in the news lately because of uh, the revelation of abuses or the depth of abuses that uh, occurred within Canadian context. And there has been calls for a reckoning in the United States and the Episcopal Church currently is trying to address that. Ella Deloria begins with framing the boarding school system as primarily beneficial regarding her context and her experience. But then she also pulls back the curtain a little bit and does show where it's difficult to navigate the boarding school experience, primarily because the way in which kinship relations operate in a Lakota context do not mirror the assumptions of Anglo-Americans who are running the boarding schools. And so she raises, I think, one of the foundational questions about what happens when indigenous people are moved into Western educational processes, which is, does education according to Western and we'd say here Christian standards require ignoring family bonds or require one moving out of the culture in which one is embedded within. And so even if the boring school experience overall is regarded as positive and that there are goods that come from this, literacy, uh, advancements, uh, economic stability, is there something lost simply by going through the process that one in a way be has to remove oneself from one's wider culture? And this really ties into how she concludes her book, speaking of Indians, which you read this portion as well, where she really reflects on how can the Lakota thrive for the future. And one of the places she focuses on is the ways in which Christian evangelization and catechesis, and here she really is speaking to her Episcopal church experience, um, was not very effective. There was a large degree of white paternalism directed at Lakota people. And we can say this is generally true for the Anglo-Indigenous encounter in North America. There's a constant focus on educating the children, educating the children, and Ella Deloria notes, yet when they reach adulthood, people are ignored. The strengths of adults are never used. It's always a reversion back to children. And so one could say that this, in a way, is a way of infantilizing the Lakota people, of only seeing them as really being capable of childlike things. And Ella Deloria asks, what has the church lost by limiting their catechism to only children. What does the church lose when it doesn't seek to further contextualize the gospel for adults? What does the church lose when it doesn't empower indigenous adults to exercise Christian leadership? As she narrates it, she speaks as multiple instances in which the white leadership simply could not see what was possible and available. So what is lost when relationality doesn't exist between the catechizer and the catechized? And she ends her book with this sort of sense of two different options for indigenous people. One option is stagnation, that uh, they are not brought along, they're not able to develop their gifts, they're not empowered to be the people that they can be. The other is a sort of dynamism where Lakota or other indigenous people both full, have a sense of their fullness as people and seek to bring that into the wider society, we could describe that as American society, or the wider church. 
And she says, you know, the future really can lie with this dynamic adaptation and context, but there's a fear that we might be stuck in stagnation instead, she says, speaking of the Lakota people. So this is a question about mission, in a way. At what point do people who are missionized become empowered to act as their own agents? I hope that this is a thread that you can reflect on as we talk about mission in general, and as we uh, look ahead to also talking about uh, uh, ministry by and among African-American Episcopalians in the 19th century and among women in the 19th century.